but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And may the Lord add his blessing to understanding of the word. Good morning, Bethany Christian Church. Good morning. Woo! All right, I think my hair blew back a little bit. Good job, all right. Well, welcome to Bethany Christian Church. Members, friends, and newcomers, we are super excited that you are here to join us for worship this morning. And those of you that are joining us online as well, thank you for being here. As many of you know, we are in a sermon series that's a part of a couple of series of sermons, a series of series, if you will, and we're talking about this book that I mentioned. It's by a man named John Mark Comer, and he lays out this framework about practicing the way, about practicing the way of Jesus, about apprenticeship to Jesus, and he gives us a method to think about this, three things. He says, you need to be with Jesus so that you can become like Jesus, so that you can do what he did. And right now, we're talking about what it means to be with Jesus. Our series is called Prayer is Primary. And why is prayer primary? Because if we're not doing this thing with God, well, then I'm not really sure what we're doing. So prayer is primary. And last week, we began that series on Prayer is Primary, and we talked about Jesus' instructions in the Sermon on the Mount on how to pray. Not what to pray, though we do say it every Sunday, the Lord's Prayer. It's actually a method. He teaches us how to pray. But this week, we're going to talk about solitude, what it means in a life of prayer to be alone. And so, if you would join me in a posture of prayer, let us pray. Lord Jesus, many have come before us who have gone into solitude, monks, nuns, those who've gone out into the desert, we call them the desert fathers. Lord God, we ask that you would teach us the importance of solitude. For thousands of years, religious teachers of all types have recognized the importance of being alone, being alone with you. I pray that today you would move within our spirit, that you would urge us to be alone, like Jesus modeled for us, that you would teach us to pray in quiet places, that you would teach us to rid ourselves of distractions, to remember that prayer is primary. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I woke up with a sense of longing to be alone for a whole day. I mean, sure, there's plenty of pastors around me, but I'm, I'm finally going to feel some rest. It's been a long year, but I get to be alone today, just me and God. I shut my phone off last night. I've been reading Steinbeck and Nietzsche, a weird combination. Breakfast is in 15 minutes. How are they announcing the day of silence again? Man, I, I hope this day of silence works, whatever that means. I just want my constant thoughts to settle down. I feel like I can't get out of my head. I mean, it's near impossible to sleep at this point. I just... I've got to keep reading at night just to get sleepy. Wow. It's clear which side of the bed everyone sleeps on in this room. I wonder how the church is doing. I wonder if they have what it takes to do this. Let me, let me get out of bed before, before I'm late for breakfast. I've still got to brush my teeth and get dressed out to go hike today. Well, that's the part I'm excited about, but I, I know they've got, they've got trails around the property. Uh, I hope there's a decent trail where, they've ta where they're taking us. I, I think they said it was beside the river. What was the name of that river again? The, the Chattahoochee? That's a weird name. Welcome to the first few seconds of my day of silence at the Jesuit Retreat Center when I went to Atlanta, Georgia. At that point this year, my brain did not want to shut off. 
I was in my head all day, every day, with plenty of thoughts occupying my time and distracting me. Now, honestly, that's, that's probably not exactly what I was thinking that morning. I didn't, uh, didn't write it down, but, but it was probably close. And that's how I had been feeling for days, weeks, maybe even months before that day. But all those thoughts, they, they probably happened a lot faster than when I just spoke to you just now. And with all those thoughts swirling around in my head, I eventually made my way down to breakfast, wondering when we'd start that day of silence. I, mean, I couldn't wait. I was practically begging for the permission to be quiet and to sort out a few things for myself. And eventually, I got that permission after our worship service that day that followed breakfast. It was 24 hours without talking to anyone. I was around people from time to time, but all in all, I spent a lot of my time alone. No phone, no talking, just me, God, some hiking, some sitting, some reading, and some journaling. After many months, I had found what Jesus was referring to in our scripture last week when we discussed how to pray. You might remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, part of our reading from last week, Jesus says this, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will, will, will reward you. In this passage, when Jesus urges us to go into our room, he's referring to a specific room. John Mark Comer shares with us that this room can also be translated as the inner room. The inner room refers to something like a closet or a pantry used to store foodstuffs and supplies. So Jesus' advice was to go hide in there, in secret, and pray. In the hustle and bustle of life in Galilee, Jesus urges his followers and those who would listen to his Sermon on the Mount to find a quiet place, to find a secret place, a place where they won't be distracted. Jesus urges them to be alone. And he also models this practice for us. You heard in our verse for today, which I know Elaine was very excited it was only one verse this time. <laughs> I feel like Elaine gets caught with the longest passages I have uh, our liturgist read from. But it says this, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He often withdrew to lonely places and he prayed. Now, I know this might sound controversial, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. If Jesus modeled it, then we should probably copy it. If Jesus modeled it, then we should probably do our best to copy it. Maybe not so controversial, huh? But it would seem like that's the case because so few of us take the time to be alone. Would you agree? And I could get into plenty of reasons why, in this day and age, it has become more and more likely for us to get stuck in the matrix, to be so caught up with the worlds, well, I don't have my phone, but the worlds that these things invent for us. But you already know. You probably already see the people around you. I know I see them at the store. I see them on the street, in the metro. They all look like this except they don't look up. They all look like this. You don't have time to be alone when you're sitting on this thing for six hours a day. Does anybody get that notification that tells you how many hours a day on average you spend on this thing? It is absolutely nuts. There are kids on TikTok 12 hours a day, and I'm not exaggerating. But maybe you're not alone. Maybe you're alone, but you're hiding from the world. Maybe you're, you're not in that inner room 
You're hiding in this inner room. You're not out in nature's solitude. You're definitely not bored. You know, it's funny, since I was born before the smartphone was invented, I, like you, many of you, actually remember that time in the, the 90s and the early 2000s when you could actually still be bored. Does anybody remember what that was like? You didn't have anything to do? Well, these days, many of our young people don't even know what that feels like because they've used screens their entire lives. And many of us forgot what that was like because we're on Facebook 24 hours a day. Our friends are never really bored because they're always, there's always one more thing to see on the internet. I don't care what corner of the internet you're on. You can take your pick of all the things that are there. If you're into video games, they've got it. If you like fashion, you can go buy anything you want. Comedy, it's never ending. News, don't even get me started. <laughs> These are multi-billion dollar industries, and they're preying on our attention. They want to convince you to buy what they're selling. They don't want you to be bored. They want you to be plugged in day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. They want to convince you that things like boredom, silence, and solitude are a thing of the past. I don't even care if you got the Headspace app, that meditation app, they're still vying for your attention too. All of them, even the ones you think are good for you. So what does that mean for us as apprentices of Jesus? Well, I feel like for many of us, You've got to actually be intentional about being bored these days. And I say these days, but I doubt the world has really changed all that much. Even back in the time of Jesus, they probably had the same problem, the same temptation to use their time as they wish. Sure, the setting was different. There's no cell phones, no computers. But the problem was still the same. No time to be alone. Too much work to do. Too distracted to pray. So I ask again, what do we do as apprentices of Jesus in 2024? What do we do to be alone? I've got a few suggestions. If you're taking notes, now's the time. Number one. Don't take the time, make the time. Don't take the time, make the time. No one is going to hold your hand and help you pray alone. I promise. You have to be intentional about making time to be alone. Making time to pray in that inner room. You have to be intentional about making time to do it. Think about it this way. Do you have a schedule? Anybody? Schedule? Put it in your schedule. All right, you don't have a schedule. Do you have a morning routine? Anybody? Add 10 minutes of prayer into your morning routine. All right, no judgment. You don't even have a morning routine. Does everybody here at least brush their teeth once a day? Good. Glad to see you're brushing your teeth, Sarah. <laughs> if you're brushing your teeth once a day, maybe spend time to pray while you're doing that. I think we've all done it enough over the years that we know how to do it without really thinking, right? Start there. You don't have a morning routine? Pray while you're brushing your teeth. Make it as easy as possible for you to have that intentional time, to be alone with God. Now, my married folks, I understand you got a his and hers bathroom and you're standing next to your spouse while you're brushing your teeth. Well, maybe don't brush your teeth at the same time. I don't know. You've got to figure it out for yourself. <laughs> but between those three things, I think you can at least find a starting point. Am I right? Now, keep in mind, I'm not telling you to become a monk overnight, right? 
I don't need you in the, in the monastery six hours, or I mean, they lived there, so I'm not gonna say six hours a day. They were there 24 seven. All I'm suggesting is that one way you might find two to five minutes of alone time, find two to five minutes of alone time to pray per day. And beyond that, I would encourage you, if you already got that settled down pat, go find more time. Go find more time. But start small and build up from there. Number two, cut some things out of your life. Cut some things out of your life. This thing chief among them, that's what I'm going to say. Get off your phone. But anyway, cut some things out of your life. Look, pastor, I mean, I, I get it. I got your first suggestion. That one makes sense. It's easy. I can do that. I pray pretty often. But I'm actually, I'm past the first suggestion. All right? I pray often. I make time to be alone with God. Got it. But I want to know how to take things to the next level. Okay. Well, I got something for you. I'm glad you asked. Hey, Bree, what was my New Year's resolution this year? To not watch TV by myself. I wasn't one of these January quitters. I'm just going to say proudly that I made it till May. Okay? I did not watch TV by myself until May of this year. That's right. I only watch TV with somebody else. Never by myself. Never watched TV alone for the first five months of this year. And I took a little break. I realized what I was learning from it. I got something out of it. I had a lot more time to read. It was a great thing. But now I'm back on it again. I'm not watching TV by myself. It's good. But you know how much time I found to read, to write, to come up with ideas for the church? Now look, I'm not going to say it was like hundreds of more hours of free time or anything, but man, It sure felt like it. It would be amazing if you cut one activity you do on a regular basis out of your life just to experiment. You will be amazed at how much time that you gain from it. And I haven't just done it with TV. I've experimented with cutting out different social media, different apps that I have on my phone. And I constantly run experiments to see what makes me happier, which helps my spiritual life, my relationship with God, the things that keep me distracted. Which brings me to my last point, number three. Run some experiments. Run some experiments. If you've never run an experiment, if you never run an experiment, then you'll never figure out how to make lasting changes in your life. You notice the very story of Jesus Christ is a story of transformation. Everyone he comes in contact with is never the same. That is what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus, that you would follow so closely to Jesus that you would never be the same. You would be continually transformed. As Paul says it, that you would be renewed by the transformation of your mind. Now, I'm not saying you necessarily need to go on a 24-hour silent retreat by yourself. Some of us don't actually have time for that, and that's okay. You could run that experiment, but you could also try other things. You could look for different opportunities within your existing routines to be alone, like we talked about with number one. You have to create opportunities for yourself. Maybe you join the prayer team. You'll get encouragement to pray together and then learn to go pray by yourself. Find what works best for you and here's the thing. Execute it. Execute on it week after week after week. Start small. Figure out that two to five minutes but then repeat the pattern. Notice our verse for today said, Jesus withdrew to lonely places to pray often. Often. Not once a month. Not every once in a while. No, it was often in his ministry that he was alone with God. And trust me, Jesus was very busy. He was doing the work of his Father. He was always ministering to people. Healing people. 
transforming the lives around him. When I went throughout my 24 hours of silence around these other pastors on that retreat, that day was truly a journey, to put it lightly. And it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows that day. Honestly, the day that I was so excited for started out with a lot of anxiety and a lot of feelings of insignificance. Throughout the day, I had moments of joy, moments of sadness, of peace, and acceptance, but what was most evident throughout that entire day was a longing for God. This longing was coupled with a realization that a retreat should not be the thing that we do from time to time. It's a thing that should be built into the very rhythms of our lives. Being alone is actually the thing that sustains us in the ministry of Bethany Christian Church and even just in life. It's the thing that Jesus modeled for us, and it's the thing that you and I and every apprentice of Jesus should be focused on, because prayer is primary. And if we're not doing this thing with God, well, then I'm not really sure what we're doing. Amen.